Oh, Johnny just said don't start. He's giving us oh. the. We can. Can we not? Can we go on live and then live again? Well, let's just stay live. Okay. Who's going to care? Hello, world. Johnny's not ready yet, so hang tight. He's whispering sweet nothings and motioning to us. <laughs> Ian's dog also here. Sorry. Or is that somebody else's dog this time? That was mine, yeah. It's all right. Dogs are welcome. <laughs> as long as they're not persistent. Oh, he's got to go. <laughs> two times is too many just kidding it's like the dog always starts barking as soon as as soon as you go live that's the way life goes Murphy's Law right okay now we got now we got two Johnnies in here <laughs> I mean, better than than on Johnny. At least can... it's a good like freeze frame. Oh. Okay, it went away. There and now go. you're gone. You can hear me. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. So these provide, hopefully, provide a better seal. Oh, you or... switched. Mm. I switched the headsets. Yeah, I'm okay. trying to be like Ian. Ian's yeah. so slick and smooth, you know. Fancy. I gotta, I gotta keep up. Yeah, but Ian's got his plugged in, so he's not that. He's not that fancy. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see if this actually goes live. Oh, look, it did. We must okay. be because Eric Westra says someone cloned Johnny. <laughs> oh, I was talking about the media media panel. But... Oh, the media board. Yeah, don't forget to do that. It was, it actually, having... did I tell you I screwed myself on that recently? Oh, no. What'd you do? I did what everybody does. I didn't make it live, and I went through. I I actually played a song for cable. I'm like, this song's for you, and it was just the two of us because we did a show with just the two of us on it. And I was like, how do you like that? He's like, I can't. I can't hear anything. I'm like, Daga! the classic rookie mistake. So, I'm in the I'm in the club now of people who've done sounds only to themselves. <laughs> All right. Um enough space on the screen okay let's uh let, let's get this uh this episode rolling let's do it it's go time Welcome, 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 Gophers. And we are here for another episode of Go Time. And this week, we're going to be talking about uh, another interesting little topic in the continuance of our maintenance series. Uh, for those of you out there that are counting, this is our eighth episode in the maintenance series. Uh, and the genesis for this episode was a little chat we had in the Gopher Slack, in the Go Time channel. Um, shout out to the Go Time channel. If you're not in there, you should definitely join. Um, but it came, it started, it started with uh, one of our listeners who pointed out that, you know, in a lot of our recent episodes, we've been uh, talking about how, you know, maybe we shouldn't have any structure for things, or maybe we should have all these nice brownfield projects and, and kind of noted that. And our wonderful producer, Jared, came around with a beautiful analogy <laughs> of experienced painters liking a blank canvas and some other folks just letting paint by numbers or liking paint by numbers. And of course, my brain as a writer just went immediately to, uh, we got to make that into an episode. So that is the very episode that you're listening to right now. We've titled it The Myth of Incremental Progress. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And joining me today, I have my usual co host of Johnny Borsico. How are you today, Johnny? Doing all right. And we also have our wonderful producer, Jared. How are you today, Jared? Happy to be here. Awesome. And we have someone who you've all heard multiple times on the podcast, but instead of joining us as a guest, this time he is now a panelist. So congratulations on joining us in the co-hosting ranks, Ian. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. 
Yeah. Yay, welcome Ian. Woo. Wow. Congratulations. So Thanks. <laughs> It's kind of self-aggrandizing, isn't it? Congratulating you for being a panelist on the show. <laughs> Congratulations right. for joining my podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Um, so we don't need any introductions since we're all, you know, hosts here. Um, so given given Jared's comment, I, I'm going to make the the analogy or I guess the translation i don't know what what to call this but um that you know this idea of painting by numbers is is really nice you can paint some really good stuff by numbers when you go out there into the world and you know get those nice coloring books you're like okay i make a nice picture but i'm gonna make i'm gonna make the conjecture that you can't paint by numbers your way to being one of those blank canvas artists that these are like two separate and distinct skill sets and one does not lead into the other. And the reason I say that is because I think a lot of the time when we think about these things, we think, oh, well, I can start by painting by numbers and I will eventually wind up being this, this grand artist or something like that. So I'd like to hear from my panel. Do you agree? Do you disagree? I'm sure you, Johnny, you have tons of nuance and <laughs> we're gonna go meta straight away. Um, so uh, mm -hmm. yeah, who, who wants to jump in first? Well, I think it well, would, it would be useful to attach the analog to the subject at hand. So if we're talking blank canvas, this was mostly in, in reference to instructions on what tools I should be using, what practices I should follow, the structure, the architecture of my software project. And I was saying that experienced developers like a blank canvas. They like to start from scratch and, and draw their picture. Paint paint by numbers, the question is like, what is what is what does that draw across to for you guys? I tend to think of framework, a pre-existing structure, a scaffold of some kind. Obviously, it doesn't apply one-to-one -one because no one's going to give you a number and say, put the code right here and put the green code right there and the blue code right there. But is that what you all are thinking when you think of paint by numbers? Because we have to at least agree on what the metaphor applies to, I think, before we can debate its merits. Oh man, Jared, you're already just ruining the whole fun. I'm going meta. That's what you guys do, isn't it? <laughs> we we don't get you'll, to you'll defining right what we don't get to defining what we mean by these things until halfway through the episode. You're just you're just all over the place. <laughs> but no, no, I think I think from my perspective, you are you are right there that it I think it is like these these frameworks um oftentimes. Or like, you know, what in the in the context of the way you layout your code, it's all of those projects that get you started and it's like here's your predefined package layout of where all of your packages go and where you put your readme and these other document files on all of that i think that is a bit um that's what i think of when i think of paint by numbers for code mm -hmm. um, but ian johnny what are your thoughts the so my i think i think it would be unfair to say that folks that use frameworks are deliberately choosing sort of a paint by numbers approach right and and because frameworks are and scaffolding and all these things these are productivity tools not really sort of strictly beginner i'm learning how to do things i need hand holding and help getting things done right which which kind of what i i assume paint by numbers kind of leans towards right you know you, you're not an experienced painter yet you need, you need, you need some structure and some help and some guidance and, and you need, you need sort of a, a, um, you need a starting point, right. To, 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 to hone your craft until you don't need that anymore until you can stay on a blank canvas and start, you know, creating frameworks. Don't, I don't think they fall in that category. They, they are strictly productivity, right. I think, right now, do they, can they help somebody who's starting out? Um, absolutely. But they help you as a beginner to be productive within, uh, uh, um, within, within a journey of building software with other experienced people who are also using this framework to, for their productivity. Right. So I think we should very, be very careful. So sort of not to downplay the role uh, mm -hmm. of frameworks. They're not really mm -hmm. kind of the same thing. I do feel that there's, there's a slight shift in the analogy there though because i think when we're talking about things like paint by numbers we're talking less about the thing that the software actually winds up doing 
and the structure that we're giving to the software to start with, right? So when I say frameworks are paint by numbers, I'm specifically saying for the structuring of your project, not necessarily what it does or like the business thing that it solves, but specifically right. like you are getting handed the places where you put all of your code, you still have to figure out what code you put there. It's kind of like if you do paint by numbers, but it's like you just pick your own colors because you understand color theory. So it looks different than other people's paint by, paint by numbers. But the structure of what you wind up with is going to be that structure there. Hmm. Hmm. So, I think this, so go ahead. Ian. Oh, so when I when I read the the payment numbers analogy, I was I was more thinking like you know in my first years as a software engineer, my manager would give me like five tasks, and in each of those tasks he's already written like broken down where this change needs to happen, how you should do it, go do it, right? And the the blank canvas for me was saying, hey, this is a feature that needs added, or this is a thing that needs done. Go figure that all out yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fascinating way of looking at it, and I see why you did that. The original GoTime FM chat was around, we had tweeted out a clean architecture template for Go services, which some of the gophers in the chat thought has too much ceremony. It was uh, Bob Martin's clean, Arch clean Code, I think, book, and some of the design patterns laid out therein were like implemented directly into this template for you to start from. And so it was very much about maybe not, and, and, and to Johnny's point, I, I agree with you on frameworks. I think maybe we set them aside in this conversation because I mean, b developers build frameworks for themselves to use. So it's not like just for beginners. Like if you build your own stuff for long enough, you will develop your own kind of framework or some, or tooling. And it's about productivity. Now, public consumption frameworks that a new person can come to and become productive faster uh, is one aspect of a framework, but you can use frameworks for, for many productivity things. I think maybe more design patterns, architecture, structure is what Chris was referring to. Is that fair, Chris? More so than uh, task, laid out tasks and more so than frameworks. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think I also have like another analogy that is similar to this one of like um, music and how there are musicians that can either like play by ear or read sheet music, but can't necessarily compose their own songs, right? Like music composition and music playing are two very different skill sets. But I think you'd also think that, hey, if you play music for a long time, you might wind up being someone that can compose music when that is, you know, not not the same. And maybe that's a little bit of a better analogy than like the paint by numbers versus blank canvas, because it's like, I think we can all recognize that artists, like musicians are like very talented people that, you know, even if they are playing songs composed by other people, that doesn't make them any less of a, a skillful human. Um, right. But there, there's a distinction there. And I think that's what I wanted like this episode to kind of be about is like when you have those types of close distinctions, um, how do we how do we kind of help ourselves not fall into the trap of thinking that we'll wind up, you know, becoming a great composer one day by just, you know, practicing a lot of music. You become a great composer by composing. You can become a great musician by simply playing music like I don't know, maybe yesterday, the day before, I saw some tweet, maybe like from Matt Ryer or something, maybe it was retweeting somebody else, of a kid, five years old, who was like ripping apart like a sonata from like, you know, Bach or something. Um, kids' hands are moving fluidly through the, I mean, you know, I'm thinking, man, this is a prodigy. This is, this kid's genius. Like, you know, I don't know any other five-year-old who can do that, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So... And then you obviously have people, you know, this being the internet, it's like, oh, yeah, that's nothing. You know, wait, right. wait, wait till, you know, he's, if, he, if he can't write music, then he's not a prodigy. He's not a genius. What, what? I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I can see what you're saying that in the pantheon of, of music, maybe this particular piece that he happens to be playing, you know, albeit eloquently, <clears throat> could be considered sort of a beginner, right, sonata versus a, a uh, someone something that you know that is more complicated right in structure and and and, and tempo and et cetera et cetera right so while while i understood the nuance that people who are critiquing this this five-year-old kid right um on their and their music skills and talents um i i get the nuance but to me at the end of the day i'm thinking 
wow, this kid is pretty good, right? Now, I wasn't slicing it and saying, oh, he's good at playing music, but he's bad at composing music. I was saying, okay, here's somebody performing the art of playing music, and they're pretty good, right? So if I bring this back to software, and I'm like, okay, can I identify somebody who's pretty good, right, at coding, at flying to the keyboard, knowing everything that needs to go in, knows the syntax of a language, knows exactly, you know, how to implement an algorithm and do all these things, right? Can I now say, well, they might be pretty good at those things, but they don't know how to engineer software or, or larger scale software or distributed systems kind of software, right? Like they're good at coding, right? Uh, they, they, they're, they're, they're very efficient, right? They're a great coder, but maybe they're not a programmer or a, an engineer, right? Because these things, you, you, you don't just master and mem memorize syntax and start ripping across the keyboard and doing things. Like that's, that's a skill, but that's not the complete set of skills you need to build an engineer, right? Software that has value to somebody who's willing to pay for it, right? So that's how I see these things. Like I'm, I'm, I don't want to take away from the act of knowing how to code, right? But at the same time, I understand that knowing how to code alone is not sufficient, right? For, for sort of a, a engineering software, right? If hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. I feel like the, the YouTube video I sent to you has like resonated with you then. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely. I, I could understand <laughs> it, right? It, it basically, we, 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 we tend to throw around the, what's the difference between a coder and, 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 a, and an engineer or whatever it is. And, you know, this, this um, person who actually, I'm ashamed to say, I didn't even know his name, Leslie Lam Lamport. And so much of what he's done has, you know, impacts my actual day to day, like how I make a living. Right. And I didn't even know who this person was. I, I felt kind of ashamed of myself. I'm like, okay, I have to make it a point to go research this person. But, you know, it's like, you know, and he calls out yet. Yeah, and I sat down to, I was just basically, he was effectively having fun. He, he didn't start out with paint by numbers. He wasn't starting out with somebody else's thing. He sat down, you know, somebody gave him space and, 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 you know, pay, Right. He sat down and, and he came from a different background as a mathematician. Right. He came into this field and basically applied what he knew and had mastered in a different field into ours, the field of computing, and created all these wonderful things that we now take for granted. Right. Um, so that that that's blank canvas. Right. To me, that is blank canvas. That is a master of something mm -hmm. that comes in and says, well, how can I apply what I know? Right. What I've been doing for decades. Right. How can I innovate? In, in this space, right? So I think those who start with a blank canvas are seeking to innovate. Those who start with, for lack of a better term, like the paint by numbers, yeah, are seeking to execute, right? I think, I think there's a difference there. The point that I was trying to make and we'll try to make here again is that while I agree with that, that man is, you know, a master who who changed the way that software is written. He's like a Picasso, you know, and like lots of us are never going to be Picasso. I'm not saying you all can't be, I'm not, can't be, I'm not trying to limit anybody. And I don't even necessarily want to lift him up to a, a level that's higher than it deserves. I only know him from the seven minute video as well. Much to my shame. I didn't know his name prior. So thanks, Chris. We'll link that up in the show notes. I put it in the chat for those who want to watch that great little video uh, mm -hmm. featuring this man's work and some of his thoughts. A lot of us just want to paint because we love painting. We take joy in it. We can make money doing it. Hold on a second. Hi. <laughs> no, go back. See, dogs are welcome, Ian. <laughs> so are daughters. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Go ahead. Hustle, hustle. It's nap time, but someone's not napping. <laughs> Let me find a good place to kick back into that. Some of us want to paint because we love painting and we're never going to be Picasso. And we may want to be a working painter. Maybe we want to paint portraits for people who pay us. Maybe isn't even like George W. Bush like paints portraits now in his retirement. And he's like average <laughs> at it, but people still give him respect about it because he's ex-president. Like we're not all going to be that. I bet he starts with blank canvases now. He probably didn't start there. 
And so I guess I was trying to say like lots of us just want to be like working software developers who put in an honest day's work, do our best, write some good software, help people out, but aren't necessarily going to make it to the level of a person who reinvents stuff. And so how do we help those people as well? I guess a lot of the conversations on GoTime, which I very much appreciate, but have also been in the business for a very long time, uh, are very deep and nuanced and from an expert perspective. And uh, hey, y'all are experts. So of course we want an expert perspective, but sometimes the question is like, well, Ian, when you start a brand new project now or given that feature today to build, and you got your blank canvas, what what do you do? Like, where do you start? You don't have to tell me where I need to start and paint my numbers me, but if I can listen to the way that you go through that process and get to your end goal, your painted picture, maybe I can learn from that. And so I'm actually setting that up, but I also would love an answer. Like, let's say your boss gives you a feature to build, Ian. You've never built this before. Maybe you have. What do you normally do? Like, where do you get going when they're just staring at a blank screen? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> okay, <fair laughs> at, the, at the beginning, of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, I start in one big file and I just go, you know. Um, just start writing code? I mean, then you're coding. Surely there's steps before that. Okay, let's pass it to Chris. Chris, you write software for a living. And you, you're a blank canvas kind of guy now. Where do you start? What do you do? Um, I think because... I am who I am. I usually start with a combination of writing some sort of document to make sure I kind of understand what the problem is. Um, actually, I guess in the beginning, beginning, when someone brings something for me to build, I ask a lot of questions and make sure that it's like, okay, well, like, are you actually asking me for the thing you want? Or are you asking me to build the thing you think you need? So that's usually where I start whenever it's a kind of, it actually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's a product person or if it's something I'm building for myself. I say like, am I, is the premise that I have assumed here, or someone else has assumed the correct one. And once I kind of figure that out, I'll start with, you know, writing up a design doc or a scope doc and being like, okay, this is this is what we're going to build. Um, and then I usually jump into some prototyping and that's where I start actually like throwing some code into a code base. And then like the project usually gets legs from there. And we kind of, you know, if it's something for work, we develop out that design doc more, we start having discussions, then we actually make the for real code base, which might unfortunately be taking that prototype code I built, or it might be starting from fresh, which is definitely a preferable thing because prototype code is never really written as well as we'd like it to be. Mm -hmm. That's usually like the, the on-ramp that I take, but that's really a lot because I'm a writer. So my comfort zone is like an empty document in Google Docs or, or an empty you know Vim window where I can just start typing out, you know, okay, what canvas. is it that I'm trying to do? Yeah. Yeah. Johnny, does that resonate with you? Is that similar to your process? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, obviously, there's there's going to be basically what what am I being asked to do? Is it to add a feature in existing software, which hopefully you know that's an easier task than yeah. than or it's, yeah, it's supposed to be an easier task than basically building something. <laughs> depends, you know, on brand new. That is, <laughs> depends on how legacy code that sucker is. Depends on how old that thing is, right? Uh, but yeah, it's it's usually you know I'm I'm whereby. Chris jumps into a, a Google Doc or you know a Vim window and, and whatnot, starts to writing things out. I tend to be more of the I'm I'm a visual thinker, so I tend to sort of uh, fire up one model or uh, you know Lucid chart or something, and then you know and I start mapping out right uh, flows, right what data is coming from where, where does it need to go, what are the boundaries. You know, yeah, basically, I'm trying to identify. <clears throat> uh, basically, I'm thinking systems, so I'm trying to identify what systems am I dealing with here internal, external, right? Like what are constraints? What are, you know, how much data needs to flow through this pipe and things like that. So I'm that I, I, I sort of picture the system in my mind and try to represent that uh, on some sort of canvas, um, you know, the, in this case, a digital one. Um, and then uh, from there, I, I start to write about the different pieces, right, of that system. Then I take, you know, Chris's approach and say, okay, well, what is this thing? Like if I were to get a readme, right, um, for a code, uh, uh, for a code base for this particular repository that represents this component in my system. What does that read me? What should that read me tell me, right? So I do do read me driven development, right? For that reason, because I want to be able to say, okay, well, if I hand this to an engineer on my team, 
Are they going to know what to do with it? Are they going to know where this fits into the bigger picture, right? So I, I kind of approach it that way. Basically, I guess you'd call that top down, whereby I, I try to get a what's the thirty thousand foot view of this thing, and then I sort of I slowly descend into sort of the the, the nitty gritty. I'm similar. I'm an outliner though, so I work in outlines. I think in outlines, mm. you know, top level, and I start to drill down and start to feather it out as it makes sense. What depends on what? What I what do I know versus what I, do I not know? You know, what's easy, what's hard. And then like, you know, sub steps, trying to take that blank canvas, which to me still after almost 20 years in the industry can be intimidating and give myself a task list like Ian received from his boss. Like, can I produce that and come up with, and this is kind of the process of like user stories or whatever, which I've never been good at writing those, but like breaking it down into like smallest chunks as an admin, I want to finish this feature <laughs> so I can go home. Uh, uh, do it that way. Uh, w one thing Dylan Bork said in the chat, which I would love to pull into this, which I think is a great point. He says the danger of paint by number, in his opinion, is that it, it can lead to uh, cargo culting of the various patterns and idioms without any insight or understanding about why things are done that way, which, by the way, I think is a great aspect of having conversations like these is because we hear about some of the whys and the it depends and not so much of the blog posts where it says here's how you ought to do it because it worked for me it's harder to cargo cult a podcast i think than it is a blog post or a book that being said sometimes you just have to follow the you just have to follow the other person's path until you realize when it doesn't actually work for you so i'm totally fine with like cargo culting some sort of rule, you know, uh, I was going to say the law of Dem Demeter, but that one's too hard to, to explain. What's well, a very simple dry, right? Everybody can remember that one. Mm. We all get it wrong, but we can all remember the acronym. And <laughs> all of us here, I think, would all talk about how dry is not the best principle in many cases. I think I've heard you guys talk about that. But we didn't realize that until we had tried to dry the crap out of everything for a while. And then it came back to bite us. And so I think it's okay to go through that process of, like I was saying in the, in the post, go ahead and paint by numbers for a little while. Don't live there. Don't stay there. But until you can start to realize, actually, blue doesn't look great on the number four. A little bit lighter blue would look nicer there. You start to develop your taste, your experience, your own history of that working well in this context, not in that context then you don't need it quite as much. But I think, you know, we do need to start somewhere. And I think that a lot of these idioms, best practices, rules, clean architecture, whatever that means, those are decent starting places. Yeah, and there's there's something you said like a while back when we were talking about Leslie Lamport and his path of like, okay, I'm a mathematician that like stumbled into computer science and then I was studying physics and then I realized that distributed, like this distributed database someone's trying to build is actually like violating the laws of physics so we can't possibly build it. Um, like I think it's, it's interesting that you kind of said like, okay, we all can't be that because I think in some ways the way that we set up our industry is that we idolize people that can do those sorts of things. And we assume two things. And I've seen this over my career. It's happened to me personally. And I've seen it happen to other people where this assumption that if you're new, you can't possibly be someone like that, right? Mm. So, like having that type of knowledge only comes from years and years and years and years of practice. And the other side of it is that if you want to stay in this industry, you should want to wind up to be someone like that. And I think for me personally, it's it's kind of funny that you say like, oh, you know, like we're not really people like Leslie Lamport. I think my own path through computer science is very similar to the one that like Leslie Lamport has taken and the way that he approached everything, right? Like I am a, as we know from this podcast, a very like heavy analogy person. Like right. I'm, I'm at my core, a writer that happens to like write programming languages. Um, and I think like that is a very distinct path for me, mm -hmm. and that has resulted in me in my career. Like, I was never a junior engineer. I've never been like an SE1 or an SE2. I've never had that experience. I don't quite understand what that experience is like. But I also know that I wouldn't want to be an SE1 or what we usually conceive as an SE1 or an SE2, someone that gets handed tasks and just executes them and like on like that on ramp to learning. For me, I always want to be at that like staff plus level, that higher level of 
okay, give me the tough problem to solve. I'll sit down and I'll figure it out. Um, I think we set, mentioned this in an episode a while back, but I think that's actually an important differentiation and distinction that we need to make as an industry that goes along with this kind of thought process of incremental progress of there are some people who are those Leslie Lamports, who are the people that can design really great big systems or find the next new thing. Um, and there's not a ton of them, but they're not going to take that cult, like climbing up the ladder approach to things. Yeah. So we need a way for them to get on board. But we also need to recognize that there are plenty of people that are perfectly happy just being handed user stories all day and executing on them. Sure. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, right? There's nothing wrong with being the person that paints in all of the colors to make the beautiful portrait at the end of the day. Because starting with a blank canvas is very intense and it takes a lot of energy to sit down and figure all the things out. And quite frankly, some places don't need, you know, paint by, some people don't need a blank canvas, right? You just, your, your marketing company needs a website. Okay, we don't need to like spin up a whole new custom go back and just go use a framework. Just go use WordPress or Drupal or Wix.com or something. You don't need to do all of the intense effort. But I think we, we do as an industry have to start realizing that these are not things that stack on top of each other. These are things that are next to each other. Mm -hmm. Well, what about uh -huh. resume driven development? I, I need to build a brand new <laughs> framework for this website. <laughs> Kubernetes great. driven development. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we find out in the big tech codes, there's now promotion driven development, which drives all sorts of new mm. projects because you can't get promoted working on the current project, even though the value is there. And these are, you know, incentive structures that people are realizing, you know, are misaligned with effectiveness, et cetera, and hard problems to solve internally. I don't envy anybody trying to set those structures up inside of a large company, but yeah, a lot of it is not a lot of it. Some of it can be exactly what you said, Johnny is like, yeah, but how do I get that raise? How do I get that new job? How do I get that promotion? And some people actually, that's the advice they're looking for. It's like, Hey, I want to be a software engineer. Y'all have been doing it for all these years. I'm trying to break in. What do I do? Where do I start? And that again, unfortunately, the answer to that still can be it depends or just pick React. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> oh Lord, Jared. Sorry, I am from JS Party, so you know. Yeah, you've been, you've been spending a little too much time on that on that podcast. Over there. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ian disagreed with something Chris said because he had a funky look on his face, and then Johnny talked. So Ian, do you want to say something? Yeah, let's go back to that idea that these don't stack that they're beside each other. Like I, I kind of disagree with that on a lot of levels. Um, but like, let's just take like go the language, for example, that didn't come out of like academics that came out of a bunch of people's years of experience, knowing how a language should work to be productive. Right. Like that wasn't these, I mean, obviously they're all brilliant people, but that didn't come out of these like mathematicians or that sort of thing. Um, so like, I think they can be beside each other, but it definitely does stack. Like, gaining context and experience does allow you to contribute more later. Like, Yes, but uh, I would say that looking at it along the dimension of time is likely going to walk you into, like, problem areas, right? Because it's, like, the reason that, you know, the founders of Go are, were so great at, you know, creating this language that we have is more because of the experiences they have, not so much as the length of time of those experiences. So I do, I do agree with you that like time is a factor here, but I think it's a factor we need to discount heavily because I think, uh, I think like if we were to start from a blank slate, <laughs> we start from the beginning. I think we could weigh time pretty, pretty well and it'd be okay. But I think because we have this assumption now that time equals experience, we actually have to. Uh, kind of subtract it or kind of push that down on our levels of understanding because I've met so many more people that it's like, well, you have 10 years of the first year of experience or you have 20 mm -hmm. years of the first two years of experience. So I think we overweight time too much of the time. And that has resulted in us as an industry just saying, okay, well, just grind for a few more years. And you see things on on job posts that are like, okay, well, you need 70 years of experience in this or 10 years of experience in that. And I think that's like exactly the thing I was kind of talking about where it's like, you can, you can learn a tremendous amount. You can learn what it takes someone 10 years to learn in one year. If you have, you know, 
one of these brains that just like loves learning or loves exploring, right? So it's a, it's a lot to do with who you are as a human more than how long that you've been doing something. Um, we we yeah, don't have really and, good ways of differentiating that right now, but yeah. What are you gonna no, say? Ian? I, I'll agree that like time doesn't mean much there, but like by experience, I mean like quantity of I don't I don't even know how to say it. Like, Some other uh, measure that's not time. It's, no, it's not like, time. It means it's like, like ten thousand hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, by experience, I mean like like a, a base of knowledge, right? Like. Yeah, if you do the same thing every day, you're not growing and learning. But if you're if you're gaining new experiences, that that is that is experience. It's new experiences, not length of time doing a certain thing. Right. So on our job postings, you have to say seven years of experiences. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I that's mean, that's. Oh, go ahead. Time, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing time. with you. I'm just saying it's really hard to quantify this thing that if yeah. it's not time based. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, time is like a good analog, like. A, it's but it's not it's not the thing yeah exactly yeah i think i think that that's also what i was trying to like get at there is it's like maybe we just shouldn't use time because it's <laughs> it's too easy for us to gamify it right it's too easy for us to yeah, sit you there just and wait. be like oh well you have you've been around for 10 years so obviously you can design systems now and it's like please don't just just please don't. i mean isn't that a fair assumption to make though we don't have a better we don't have better heuristics for that right so it, it, it's it's like there's an assumption that you must make as an employer, hiring manager, engineering director, whatever, right? That given enough time, somebody has seen enough kinds of problems that they are experienced enough to help us not repeat certain mistakes, mm -hmm. right? That that's a fair assumption to make, right? I I can I, I mean. I know it happens, you know, people will have seven years, seven years of experience, just the first year repeated seven times, right? They didn't, they don't grow and learn and mature. And, and, and but I, I would, I'd argue that those are far and few between, right? There's not a, at least in my career, um, which I've been grateful enough to be in doing this for close to 25 years now, I've come across maybe one or two people during that time that basically had a lot of years of experience in the industry, but really that didn't show in, in the kinds of things they were proposing, the kind of the, the way they communicated. All right. And I, I, I account for, you know, language barrier and all these things, right. Um, more like communicating a design and things like that. Right. So the, the, it's possible for years to have gone by for you to not grow as an engineer. Right. They, mind you, they were great coders. If I give them like a specific task with specifics, on, and this is what I want you to do, do this, do this here, go find out what you need to find out there, what you need to fix is over here, right? Very specific things, they will get it done like quickly and, and, and efficiently, right? But if I said, okay, design me a, a web scraper, right? That, you know, scrapes this website, uh, um, they'll be at it for like, you know, three, four months until I come back and says, uh, so where are we, right? So it's it's one of those things where 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 if you've been experienced enough, right? If somebody comes to me, okay, choose that example. Somebody comes to me and say, "Hey, design a web scraper," uh, and they say, and and they give me the parameters and say, "Hey, this is what it needs to do." Blah blah. blah. The first thing I do, I'm like, okay. Uh, NPM I go to install web and scraper. Say, <laughs> 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 right, right. I mean, like, why why am I gonna reinvent that wheel? Right? I've got better things to do in my time. <laughs> I mean, you know, I need you to, I need you to be experienced enough, right, to recognize that, right, and go get a damn package off the internet that does this, right? Uh, yeah. Like, like I, I don't need you, you know, as a junior developer reinventing that wheel. That's not where your time is the most valuable to me, right? So that kind of judgment, right, I think is what comes with time, right? Like you, you, you've seen this, a few patterns, um, you've been coding for a while, so you, you know how to deal with syntax. And you've been around other people who know what they're doing, so you, you pick up some of the you know tricks of the trade, that kind of thing, and then you allow time to to allow these things to just you know gestate and and become part of you know your skill set mm -hmm. as as an engineer, right? So I think that's that's the element time. Uh, you know, I, I don't I don't think we can discount time uh, um, um, here at all. Like I don't, and again I'm biased because I've been doing this for a while, and I can right. say that okay, yeah, time has added you know so much to my skill set, whatever it is, but. You know, I, I think in, in my experience, you, you need the time right, to grow. I, I wonder if this is, has, a, has to do with like where in the industry each of us is kind of positioned. Because I think it's like it's 
it's interesting to me that the that you Johnny and Jared had never heard of Leslie Lamport before because it's like I think I think part of it's because I like I've spent so much time in distributed systems that it's just like oh yeah Lamport clocks Leslie Lamport of course mm -hmm. um but I think like distributed systems specifically is one of those areas where it really isn't the amount of time that matters nearly as much as like the the knowledge that you have attained right and you can obtain that knowledge very very quickly but it it takes a like i don't like people's brains are different so your ability to understand things like you know distributed system concept like there is no now and like you can't use time like that's not something that you i mean maybe maybe i'm wrong here maybe, maybe you can sit there and work through these problems long enough and you'll eventually figure out and wrap your brain around the concept that you know time is not at all what you've thought it is your entire life but i think that's more of like a, a a way that we have to teach people things and the way they have to kind of like be curious and be okay enough with being frustrated at not understanding something to kind of like dig into and i think like that's a better marker of how experienced someone is than the length of time they've been doing something right like curiosity or at least for like this section of things i think it's i think probably part of the problem here ultimately is that we're it's it's like we're trying to story point right now we're trying to reduce like a huge space of things down into like a single entity right and it's like how you gain experience as a front-end engineer is vastly different than how you gain it as a back-end engineer is different from distributed systems engineer or from an embedded engineer or from like a you know there's there's all of these different types of software engineering and i think that you know at the end of the day we can't just you know, saying length of time is like an easy thing because that's something you can trace across all of those different types of engineering. But I think it means a different thing in each space. So I don't so, think they're like as comparable. I have no idea if any of that made sense. So sorry if it didn't. It seems like what you're <laughs> arguing for mostly is for diversity of experience. Because the, the perspective, the unique perspective is what sometimes, and in the case of Leslie Lamport, actually leads to the innovation looking at it from a perspective that nobody else looked at it from because of his background or because of your background as a writer, you look at software differently than I do, for example. And so that can be very profitable for all of us, right? Beneficial is having diverse perspectives chipping away at these various problems, which I think we're all for. Um, but also- and this is why you're the producer. You did that perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, I think when you take the diverse perspectives and then you also give them experience, like let's all get the experience. I think they all get better. I think uh, he would confess that he's probably a better at everything he did when he was you know, in the business for 25 years than when he was in it for five years. That being said, a lot of newbies invent brand new radical things that nobody else sees because they don't have the, the experience to say, well, that won't work. You know, They just try it. And the rest of us are like, well, that's never going to work because we've been in the business 25 years. And so a lot of uh, new things, new techniques, new frameworks, thinking about it differently, come out of people who are 21, 22, or three years into the business. Maybe you're not actually young, but young to the industry. Yeah. And I think there's, oh, does someone else want to say something? So just kind of yep. riffing on something you said, like uh, I think the one piece that you're like discounting about time is you might be able to gain all this knowledge very quickly, right? But what time does provide is like opportunity to have decisions that you thought were good turn out to be bad. And without like that time aspect, you don't gain any of like that experience. Like like you need the you need the retrospect. Like you need the to look back and evaluate if this was so a good I, or bad. I, I wish I, I wish I could find some of the people that have written software I've inherited and be like, look. <laughs> Look, Look at what you did. idea was. Look at what you did. That would be a that would be a cool reality show. It's like Johnny just chases down people that used to work on software and shows them the ramifications of their decision making. That would be a good show. Oh man! Look at what you did. Um, I guess Learn I guess this. I guess like the thing I just thought of when you were saying that, Ian, is like time is a useful way of comparing yourself and on your own trajectory, right? So it's like you at one year of experience versus you at 10 years of experience or 10 years of doing this. Like, hopefully you have acquired a lot more and you've moved a lot more. But I don't think that's, like, I think the thing I'm pushing against is that that's not comparable between people, 
right? And I think that's like the issue at hand is like 10 years of my experience is, is very different from 10 years of Johnny's experience or Jared mm-hmm. or your experience, right? Like that's different. And it has a factor of like, what is the industry like over the course of 10 years? Sometimes we have like a lot of change in a small period of time. Sometimes there's not much change in a, in a period of time. Um, but yeah, I think like, I think Jared, you, you put it precisely there if it's just like, the diversity of experiences that you wind up having. I think part of the thing that I dislike about this kind of incremental thinking approach to our industry and the way that we kind of ramp up engineers from like SE1 to SE2 to senior to staff and blah, 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 is that a lot of the times when you're in those lower roles, you're kind of indoctrinated into the way of doing things that everybody else is doing. Because it's assumed that like the people that have more experience know how to get things done and they've been doing this longer, and they've been successful. So they want to give you all the tools, and they want to shortcut you from having to do the work that they had to do. But it's like the work that they had to do is what made them successful. So you can't like get around that. And Mm -hmm. I've seen at a number of companies I've been at, like this attempted to happen. I've even had someone, uh, like a senior in a company I was talking to, and like my philosophy is like just hire good people, hire people that are curious and want to learn and you'll do well. And he was like shocked at this. He was like, Oh, we can't do that. Like my philosophy on this is like, I hire you. And then I, it's like a cook in a kitchen. Like I teach you how to chop carrots and I teach you how to chop onions. I teach you how to chop this. And then you show me that you can do those things. And the thing I very much disliked about this is that kind of like, I will show you how to do this thing. And I will show you how to, how to do things as I know how to do them. And that's the way that we learn and grow. But that really pulls away a lot of the diversity that we'll wind up having. Because once again, we're saying, well, you're the one that, you know, I, I, I'm the one with the experience and knowledge. So I'm going to give that to you and you're going to have it. And then you're not going to have to make the same mistakes that I made. Yeah. I understand where you're coming from. I don't know if in practice it works out that way all that much because like you yourself, like buck against that. Like maybe you go through it for a little while and you're like, well, this is BS. I'm not going to do it that way. This way is better. And I think that people that have those different experiences will start with their boss or their mentor's set of rules. And here's how you're going to do it. Here's how you chop celery. And then eventually their experience and their knowledge and they're, they're just like, yeah, and this is actually, I learned this other way. I'm going to start doing it that way. And maybe in, in certain circumstances you get in trouble for that or whatever. But, um, that brings me to Sandy Metz's rules. Are you guys familiar with these? Sandy Metz is mm-hmm. a great OOP teacher, programmer, very experienced. She teaches people how to do object-oriented programming. And she has rules that she just hands out to new developers. And like the rules are like uh, classes can be no longer than 100 lines of code. Like She has a set of rules. <laughs> and she's like, no, you're going to follow these rules. Uh, methods can be no longer than five lines of code. Most of her work, I think, is mm-hmm. in Java and Ruby. Most of her experience and most people she's teaching pass mm-hmm. no more than four parameters into a method. Hash, hash options are parameters. Like this to me is is paint by numbers to a certain degree. And I would never follow any of these, right? But, <laughs> okay, a couple of them. Four parameters is, I mean, these are good rules, but... I probably wouldn't follow them, but if I was just getting started and like needed to, to ramp up, or if I had somebody starting fresh and was like, how do I do this? I think starting with a strict set of rules is actually a pretty good place. And then you say, follow these. This is Sandy mess. This is me. She says, you just follow these until you know better. Mm -hmm. And once you can explain why you're breaking the rule, then go ahead and break the rule. But until then just follow the rule and your code will be better. That's Mm -hmm. a pretty useful teaching technique that a lot of people have appreciated and so and you need time for that exactly. understanding yeah i i feel like the last part of what you said there is like the the crucial part though is like use these until you can basically articulate why they're wrong and i think there is some form of time component to that but i think some people will be able to do that much quicker than other people yeah of course um, this is just me being very like, I am glad I never started off as a junior engineer and I don't want people <laughs> that are like me to have to slog through that. And when they're sure. like, no, but I want to go design things. And people are like, but you don't know enough. You haven't been around long enough. It's like, but I'll be but when I was a enough. very, when I was green behind the ears, no wet behind the ears. I don't know how these things go. When I was green, I wanted rules. I wanted structure. I wanted because I didn't know how to do it otherwise. And right. so I was happy to have them. 
And that's why in my in that chat, I did say we won't, some people just want to paint by numbers for a while. Like that for a while was, I mean, it was a flippant statement, but that was part of it. Because like, I don't think anybody should want to paint by numbers their entire career. What kind of joy in life are you going to get out of that? That being said, there's worse careers where it's worse I mean, off. So. You'd be surprised. There's a lot. I've met a number of people in my career that have just like, they're literal, just like, just give me the task. I, I have will to. do it. That's all I've I I've never understood do. those people, but I'm happy that they're happy, you know? Yeah. Totally get it. But I think that you do, you should, and you should want to advance. I mean, I don't know. From my perspective, you should want to go on from there. If you don't, I mean, I guess, Godspeed. like, once again, like, diversity of perspectives, right? Like, what yeah. you just said of, like, when you started, you wanted, like, a nice set of rules. Like, when I started, I think that the thing that actually got me to be in this industry long term was that in the beginning, there weren't any rules. And I had to figure all of this stuff out. And even though I was, like, quite literally screaming at my computer sometimes because I had the unfortunate um, start in Drupal, which if you ever use Drupal, it's like the most complex piece of software on the planet. It's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> but like that screaming is actually what pulled me in and what like made it worth it for me at the end of the day that I like, I figured this stuff out. I learned how this thing worked. I understand this now. And that is what gave me the energy to like continue going through the industry. And I think if I had had someone just kind of giving me the answers or giving me rules, I it wouldn't have stuck with me. I would have found something else where I could have done that more curious and creative exploration. So I think, I think at the end of the day, like what we're all kind of saying here is like diversity matters and understanding that like we are all different and we have different backgrounds and there's no single type of engineer at the end of the day. And we should have, um, we should have roles in organizations and promotional paths that allow us to be the diverse individuals that we are. Um, not thinking that the kind of average engineer is the the one that everybody should, you know, go after. Or aspire to be, I guess. But we won't. We're a cog in a machine somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, uh... a lot, there's a lot of work to be had in turning spreadsheets into web forms. And that's what a lot of our jobs are. You know, mm -hmm. take this spreadsheet, mm -hmm. put it on the web. And that's... Spreadsheets, though. Let me tell you, spreadsheets are one of the most advanced forms of programming that is out there. Like, I it don't is... disagree. Woo. People are like, people are like, oh, you just write Excel. I'm like, have you tried building something good in Excel? <laughs> like, uh, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen enterprise scale software built in Excel, my friend. Like, you, you, you have not yeah. seen software until you've seen software written totally. in Excel. Yeah. I've seen efforts to replace Excel with custom software written to do the exact same thing, but the people won't adopt it because they're just, they built that Excel themselves. You know, like, no, this is how I do my job. Don't make me do my yeah. job some other way. No. Half the time, that custom software doesn't even do everything the Excel does. That's what they're no. saying. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> That's their whole point. Yeah. This is I, worse I off like, than what I have now. I feel like Excel is like a peak of programming. It's just like, I don't know. This is like this super dynamic, instant compilation and you just start plugging in some formulas you can just do some crazy stuff i'm just like oh. yep. if you couldn't tell i just built out an entire system using uh, not excel but google sheets so i am very hype on the you know spreadsheet train right now they are hey fantastic. man spreadsheets will get you a long way but you know don't don't steep on the spreadsheets you know um so a lot of times i mean look look at what Airtable. all right they made it built an entire business around spreadsheets <laughs> i mean yep. come on you know yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, so we got to get to our last segment, but does anybody have anything else they want to say before we jump into that? I Just think the coding versus programmer distinction is kind of silly. Oh, come on, Jared. Now we Ooh, have to like... <laughs> disagree. <laughs> disagree. <clears throat> Hard disagree. Wait, wait, wait. I, I save I, that for unpopular opinions. I, 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 need, I need more. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got to move on. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't, uh, I guess I don't, we, we should play maybe a, a little bit of the audio from Leslie Lamport, or at least let people go listen to what he had to say about it. And Johnny described it a little bit, but he does make this distinction between being a coder and being a programmer. And I think he elucidated it in a way that was okay. I think that these are interchangeable terms that mean different things to different people. And we end up uh, splitting hairs and inventing our own definitions of the words in order to kind of do a weird form of gatekeeping where we're like, you're not a programmer, you're a coder. 
And mm. I don't know. I just feel like, come on, guys, we're all trying to do the same stuff here. So that's that's my hot take on it. Uh, people people who actually say that though in in real life, yeah, those are those are d bags. Don't don't listen to that nonsense. Agreed. Like it. That, this is this is something that when 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 you're doing some introspection and you say, hey. Like, what does someone like, you know, Leslie Lamport mean when he says there's a difference between a coder and a programmer within the context of the things that he was building and actually, you know, uh, putting together and innovating on? Like, what does he mean in that context? Right. Or if, if you go into any other, you know, uh, company and they say, do they, do they say, oh, for these people, we consider them coders. We pay them less than those who we consider programmers. Right. They, I mean, nobody actually does this. Right. So it's supposed to be something that helps you. Personally, I think it's introspection, right? Like, am I coding? Am I programming? Am I engineering? I don't tend to use coder versus programmer. I tend to use uh, um, coder um, and engineer um, more readily than I do programmer. What's wrong with programmer? Think... Nothing wrong with programmer. I think engineering is... I is... <laughs> I think engineering, <laughs> engineering is what happens when you add time to the mix, right? Mm. So, you know, were your decisions good decisions? But that's your definition you of coding? engineer. I think that we all kind of create these definitions because I've had these conversations with hundreds of people and they all define it a little bit differently. And a lot of times it's positioning. And I don't think that's mm. what he was doing. But I think what he was doing was putting two words on what I consider what we like busy work and then like hard work. He's like, here's like where I need to be creative and thoughtful and stuff. And then the rest of the time I'm coding. And it's like, well, that's that's not how other people use the terms. So I felt like it was a weird... Play, but I mean, in his headspace, if it makes sense, I'm not, I'm not mad at him or anything. I just think that we, when we tend to use coder, programmer, developer, engineer, architect, we're positioning. And coder it tends to be at the bottom of that totem pole. And people, I agree with you, people do that. They're kind of D-bags. But they too tend to try to kind of do that. And so I just think it's all kind of silliness. Well, yeah. I, I can see where... Yeah, if you don't know who Leslie Lamport is, because like he's he's the same person that's like unit testing is BS. You should be writing TLA plus instead. <laughs> so like, I he has... say that I was kind of interested in the TLA plus thing. I'm like, dang, am I a total right. user? Like, yeah, yeah brushing on my math here. <laughs> once again, he's a mathematician. He's like, why are you taking this like plugging? Oh, does addition work? Let me add two plus two and four plus. Like, no, just write a proof to make it work. Write but I think the interesting thing that I mean, I think the reason it what he said about coders versus programmers resonated with me so much is it's because something I think I've been talking about for like four years now of like there are people that love to study the language and love to you know write the language well and do that well and there are people that are trying to tell a story with and I feel like the programmers are the people that are trying to tell a story they're trying to they're trying to solve a problem and they might not be the best at writing actual code, right? I think there are plenty of novelists out there who are absolute crap with the English language and like their vocabulary is super tiny, but they tell phenomenal stories. And then there's another group of people who are like absolutely fantastic with the English language and like know all of the little intricacies and like read the, like read the Chicago manual of style to themselves to go to sleep at night, <laughs> right? And I think, the, but those people are like Thank extremely necessary to us. <laughs> and I know people who have, not me, not me. I try, but okay. Um, but I feel like for us as an industry, like you know, we're missing that, right? Because like the writing industry, those people are called editors, and they are in some like in some regards at the top, right? You think of the editor in chief of a newspaper, mm -hmm. that's top dog, and that's not a person who's a writer. That's a person who's an editor, and that's like a different training skill, right? Uh, I remember talking to Angelica once, and she mentioned how you know when you're in. J school, you can choose to be a writer or an editor and you go sure. down these different paths and you learn different things. And I think that's a distinction we need to make as an industry because the reason we can be so, uh, you know, we can kind of swap these words out so easily is because we haven't taken the time to really say, but do the, does the distinction between these two roles matter? And I think it does. Right? I've run into a lot of people who are excellent at taking code that's written and making it phenomenally better, like getting better algorithms in there, mm -hmm. um, making it cleaner, do, doing all of that sort of stuff. But if you ask them to write the code themselves, they'll be like, oh, right. They'll be like, that's not what I do. Mm -hmm. And there's also people that are like really good at like solving the problem, but don't use efficient algorithms, don't design the code well, don't write comments or document anything. Yeah. And I think you need to have both of those people in the organization. And I think it's valuable to kind of separate those two things. And I feel like that is in his own special way, the the thing that Leslie Lamport was trying to get at. I think that's fair. And I do think he was being introspective, like Johnny says. And I don't think he was being obtuse or damaging in any way. Yeah. I agree with you, Chris. I think that we need to go through that work 
if we could go through that work and have like an RFC or a spec that said like, here's what these different roles mean, and we're all going to agree, then I would be okay with it. It's that they mean different things to different people. And I hear people using them as a way of uh, positioning or gatekeeping a lot. And yeah. it, I think that does more harm than good, but yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. Like we should, we should be looking at these as positions on equal footing, not as like, Oh, you're a coder. That's like, you're not as good as me. Like I hate, I don't like that. I don't yeah. like when people do those things. So anyway. All right. Sorry for throwing that bomb in there. If you're trying to transition <laughs> last minute. Like, yeah. Uh, gotcha. <laughs> aren't you the producer? Are you supposed to be the one that's keeping us on time? Like, I'll edit this whole part out. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, time for unpopular opinions. I actually think you should probably leave. All right. Uh, Ian, do you have an unpopular opinion? I think I do, actually. Oh, oh, oh. Beco- right. it becomes a host, yeah, yeah. and now all of a sudden he has some popular opinions. <laughs> all right, so I've seen a lot of pushback, like on Twitter and everywhere, about this idea of like a take-home project during interviews. Um, I think that's okay. I think a take-home project is fine. I think there should be a time limit if it's more than three or four hours. It should be paid. But I think take-home projects, great way to interview, way better than the whiteboarding and the crazy other things that they do in interviewing but that's that's it i will agree with you but only if like it's actually something that is like has to do with what the company does so like no leak coding none of that nonsense um and i uh, and also if like the person doesn't have like a crap load of open source code out there right like the thing that is annoying is when it's like look, there's all of these examples of me being able to write code in the wild. And they're like, but we just we just need you to write some code for us. Like that that irks me a little bit. But if it's something related to what the company does, I think it I think it's all right. But yeah, definitely yeah. like make it paid and also like give people as much time as they want. None of, of this like get this back to me in a week. Like if it, if it takes them a month, it takes them a month. And by take home project, I don't mean like any kind of leak coding thing, but like an actual like, like I, I've had it where I've done like a, an issue on a public repo, like that kind of stuff. I think that's one of the best ways to do it. So I will agree with you here. So you got two for two. Oh, so uh, maybe it is good, popular. There's good ways of doing it and bad ways of doing it. We had Jacob Kaplan Moss on the change log. I'll link that up talking about principles for hiring engineers. He's put a lot of thought and time into this process he's been hiring for a very long time and he has like these rules that you can follow that he thinks are are empathetic and fair and a good way of doing that and he also describes how hard of a problem it is finding out if somebody's a good match so i'll link that up worth listening to if you haven't yet johnny are you with him can we go can you go full panel agreement yeah, I think you can, especially in when you start to rank, you know, from from worst to best um, yeah. practice around this stuff. I, I think you know, I'd definitely pick a take home instead of a, you know, let's 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 flip this binary tree together on this whiteboard on a whiteboard. Yeah. So I so, popular, so a yeah. popular opinion. My bad. My bad. <laughs> I, I I do feel though that people when they go to vote on the Twitter poll will probably be like no, so you might you might wind up being unpopular. We, we added a lot of nuance to that unpopular opinion, so. Yeah, we'll cut all that out, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, not nonsense. <laughs> Johnny, do you have an unpopular opinion? Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if that's going to be unpopular, but I know for me, it, it's, it's something I've been struggling with. Passion is so overrated, man. Like, it really mm. is. Um I mean, I have a bunch of projects that I'm working on. I was passionate about them when I first started. Now I'm not passionate about them anymore, but I still got to get it done, right? I still got to get them done. I still got to ship them. I still got to do the writing, do the recording, do the, all the things. I'm, I, I want to move on to the new and shiny thing that I caught, caught my eye, you know, three months ago. But I can't because I made commitments and I got to get these other things that I was passionate about done, right? So passion fades. 
the only thing that really matters is doing the work. Do the work, get it done, ship it, and move on. I, I agree with you. I think I've, I've read a few things that are like, you know, passion's good to get you started, but it's the um, stubbornness that actually winds up being the thing that gets you through it all, right? You got to be stubborn about something. Be like, I'm getting this thing done because I said I wanted to get it done and I like the idea. But yeah, I, I, I think passion is overrated. So, Ian, Jared. It's I good think passion is a short less money for the same job. I didn't hear what either of you said. <laughs> <laughs> you go first. It's a good way to pay somebody less money to do the same job is for them to be passionate. Mm. So it seems like ooh. It, 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 ooh, it could be uh, predatory yeah. at times, I think, to call on someone's passion because their, their excitement, their pure love allows right. them to say, well, I don't need as much money or I'll work more because I'm passionate. So I think it's kind of can be that way. Mm, but... F you pay me. <laughs> <laughs> That's your experience talking, Johnny. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree with you. I think it is overrated. And, you know, it's the whole 99% ins uh, perspiration thing, right? 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Goes back. I don't know who said that originally. Probably Mark Twain or Abraham Lincoln <laughs> or Albert Einstein. <laughs> One of those three says all the quotes. What were you going to say, Ian? Oh, I, I'm along the same lines. I think passion is like a, an internal shortcut to getting things done. But like at the end of the day, it's it's the output that matters, right? Mm. So yes, All I right. agree. It's under it's overrated. No unpopular opinions on this episode. No unpopular, not today. Goodness. Okay, okay Jared. You right, I've, shared, I've shared this one elsewhere, but I'll share it here to see if gophers agree or disagree. And I think that most of the time that we as developers spend tweaking our configs customizing our shell, putting our shortcuts into our text editor, writing those one line shell scripts. Most of that time is time not well spent. I think we spend hours to save 30 seconds. I think we could just learn the editor as it exists. And I think that we could get a whole lot done in a whole lot less time if we weren't always tweaking stuff. Mm -hmm. I agree. With I that. agree. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny. Uh, I, I will, I will disagree. I will disagree. Yes. Um, because I think there is, there is a productivity um, gain, right. That materializes once, once you understand sort of how you work best, how you, how quickly your hands move across the keyboard, for example, it can be as simple as that. Um, having the right shortcuts in the right place, or you know, being able to you know, hit a hit a, a quick you know, write your script and invoke it uh, um, on on your shell in the morning, and it does a bunch of things for you that you otherwise would have had to do manually, save you time. So I think all these things are they have value, and I will agree that there there's a threshold, right? There there's an amount where you have sort of diminishing returns on that mm -hmm. stuff, right? So if I'm if I'm gonna do something that yes it's tedious um in the world of sre you know toil is is a thing and and you know we can't sometimes we can't always fix toil um to, to the degree we'd, we'd like to um but uh you know because doing the toilish thing you know that takes an hour you know this week and next week and the other week you know to total three hours um as opposed to sitting down and taking up the entire week to automate something right that you know like <laughs> you spend like 20 hours automating something that takes three hours right yes you've automated it but like what was the game right especially right. if it's something that's gonna go away you know in two months right so there's decisions to be made right as to where is basically where do i where's the value right where does right. it start diminishing right so i think that there's nuance there um but i on it on its face as you as you're about to cut out all the nuance that I've just said, <laughs> <laughs> I'll say I'll say no, I disagree. Okay, I, I feel like though that you just agreed with him he did. because he, he said that me. like <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say it's all useless. I he see. Just said... I, I I hedged. I said most of the time that we spend, and the reason why I say that is because we have a natural inclination. I speak from my own personal experience to overdo it, to over automate, to over tweak to over customize because it's fun it has dopamine hits 
and it's a good way to procrastinate and not do what we're actually supposed to be doing. And so we tend to overdo it. And mm -hmm. so most of the time we spend is not time well spent. I'm not saying none of it. I mean, definitely if you can save 30 minutes every day by spending two hours one day, and you're going to run that for the next year, you're way in the green, right? Or in the black. I don't know colors very well. I need to paint it's, by numbers. It's, it's in the black. <laughs> you're in the black. So, okay. so then, then you just have to change your, uh, your opinion to always, not sometimes, and then I'll be right. Okay. That would be more bombastic, probably more unpopular. <laughs> I'm still learning. I'm still learning how to be as unpopular as I can, as I can be. Uh, okay. I've, I've got an unpopular opinion. Oh, let's um, hear it. Ooh, they don't. I, I thought about this when I was talking. Because I think about this episode, I was talking to a friend about it. And I, I will make the assertion that uh, Rust is the Esperanto of programming languages. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Say more. <laughs> <laughs> and for those who don't know, better go go watch on on Canto. So, so you know, Esperanto is just this you know language that's you know designed to be like you know easy to learn, like basically like a better version of all of the languages that we have, and to do all of those things you know in a more capable way, make it easier for people to communicate and all of this, and it has all these aspirations, and in some ways is kind of meant to replace languages like English, um, which are, you know, difficult to learn, very warty, really annoying if you, like, don't learn as your first language. Um, and I feel like that's kind of like what Rust is, where it's kind of targeting trying to replace C, replace this dominant language in the world. Um, and while it is a nice language, like Esperanto is a nice language, like I know a fair bit of Esperanto, um, the aspiration that it will be the language that everybody will speak or that it will replace like something like C in the future is just incorrect and it will not do that. Um, but that doesn't mean we, I'm not saying we shouldn't have it. I'm just saying that it is basically Esperanto, but in programming language form. Okay. I don't have a take on that. I don't know enough about Rust. I can't either agree nor disagree. I just thought, I just thought you were talking about Yonkanto. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> no, 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 no. <sighs> okay, that's a natural language. Yeah, yeah. yeah Esperanto every day. Is, it's a real language that people around the world speak and write. All right, you learn something new every day. Where yeah, is it so... mostly spoken? Uh, it's one of those like global languages, so it's not like a uh, centralized anywhere. So literally, like someone in the early 1900s sat down and was like, "I want to design a good language." So they sat down. And they literally created a language that was like, okay, this should be easy to learn. It should be very consistent. Right. Um, it is a very consistent language, right? It's very, it has a, a nice set of features. It's kind of like the opposite of like German or something where it's just like, why do I have like nine different versions of the, it's like kind of the opposite. Of right. It kind of is like the SKCD. There's too many specifications. What we need is one more specification that fixes all the problems with the other ones. <laughs> and then there's one more specification. Yeah, you know? yeah. N plus one. Yeah, that's where log yeah. fifteen got its name. Popular Go pra a logging package. Log fifteen got its name from that. Uh, wow. From the XKCD comic. That's why it's called log fifteen because it's like there are fourteen specific. Like, oh, we need it's to make the a new one. Now there are fifteen. Yeah. That's cute. I like that. <laughs> that's a resume-driven project right there. <laughs> I wrote a logger. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I guess my opinion is uh, not unpopular. Well, we'll I guess see. it's neither. We'll, it's we'll have to vote it out. We'll have people. <laughs> I don't know if gophers are going to. Is it a chance for gophers to dunk on rust? You know, it might be with the way it might go popular just because mm, that. Yeah. If I saw yeah, this on I... Twitter, I'd click yes. I, I agree. <laughs> but I don't have a reason. Like... <laughs> That's how most um, of the voting goes, I'm sure. Well, I told my friend that I was uh, that I was talking to him like this is going to be my unpopular opinion on the next episode. So, let's st let's stick there you that. go, friend. <laughs> All right. Well, um, this has been a fun episode. Um, hopefully, not too meta for our listeners out there, and hopefully, you've learned a bit about you know the myth of incremental progress. I feel like it's it's buried somewhere in the content of this episode. Um, but yeah, so uh, thank you for joining me, Johnny and Jared, and uh, welcome, Ian, and thank you for joining as well. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it was fun.
right, so I have an episode request. Okay. I want an interview with Leslie Lamport. (laughs) Oh. Why not? Why not? Why not us? Why not Go Time? The Go Time interview. Sounds like he does interviews. He just did this one that we we all watched. That was just a few days ago. Yeah, we just need to find an in with someone at Microsoft. We can probably like go and talk to him internally and be like, hey. Totally. Or you're a producer, Jared. You should be able to make I'll that work happen, on it right? if you guys want to do the show. If you don't want to do the show, I'll have him on the change log. But I figure you I guys get first dibs. You want to do the show? Yeah, man. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. Chris, I'll work in? on getting another lamp horn on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm definitely in. I'd That'd love to cool, talk right? to him. Right? Yeah. As a distributed systems human. I was going to was gonna say, we need some sort of a go time tie in, but it sounds like distributed systems good enough right there, right? I mean, like half of like things people are writing in Go is distributed systems, right? right? You know, microservices, Kubernetes, etcd, like all of these things. Half the databases that are distributed databases out there are written in Go. So, cool. That'd be awesome. It'd be it'd be crappy if you said, "Hey, I hate Go." Actually, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Come on, yeah, JS we, party. we have to coach him. We have to coach him before he joins. <laughs> coach him first. Seven like, reasons like Go is the these worst. These are some of the things you don't say. <laughs> Uh, you walk away people start writing tla plus for all of their testing now it's That's a popular opinion go is the pig latin of programming languages <laughs> <laughs> oh god damn uh, oh, man. Oof. well well that was a fun conversation i don't know uh hard to tell if it was good or not but it was fun yeah um oh i'll i'll, I'll pull us off youtube Bye.